Hey guys, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani here. Today's video is gonna be on low blood pressure. We talk a lot about high blood pressure, but most people don't think about low blood pressure. Why is my blood pressure low? We're gonna dive in. Before we do, please smash that like button. Put your comments down below. Are you someone that has chronically low blood pressure? Do you, have, do you bend over and stand up fast or get up from laying down and get dizzy when you stand up? Is that you? If not, we're gonna talk about why that is the case, okay? So blood pressure is important. We need about 120 over 80. So the systolic number, that's how much pressure your heart has to, to, uh, to muster when it contracts, okay? So you have a certain amount of pressure in the arteries, okay? And then your heart has to overcome that pressure to get that blood out of the heart into the blood vessels, okay? The higher the arterial blood pressure, the harder the heart has to work. So high blood pressure is a big deal because it can strain your heart over time and can, and can lead to heart failure, okay? And then the diastolic number, which is actually really important, that's the number after your heart beats when it's relaxing, right? So a nice low diastolic pressure is really good because that means you have a lower pressure when your heart is relaxing. So keep that in the back of your mind. So when your blood pressure starts dropping, well, now we may have an inadequate amount of pressure to perfuse blood up to the brain. So it's very common when you bend over or stand up fast and you get from a laying down position and come up, you can get dizzy because that blood doesn't perfuse fast enough up to your brain and you need oxygen and nutrition to have healthy brain function. So when you have low blood pressure, you're gonna have a lot of these cognitive issues with change in body position. Now, the reason we have to talk about, about why this is the issue, it typically comes down to the adrenals, okay? Your adrenal glands, they help maintain and regulate blood pressure. There's, they have a, a hormone called aldosterone, which is a mineral corticoid. So you have three major layers of the adrenals. You have the, the outer, the inner, and then the innermost layer. And the mineral corticoids are produced in that outer layer. And so the same layer that produces cortisol is one of the same layers that produces mineral corticoids. So when your adrenals are stressed from blood sugar issues, from chronic inflammation, from emotional stress, from a poor diet, from gut infections, from poor digestion, it's common to see the adrenal dysfunction symptoms cross over and also affect the blood pressure. And the reason why is we make this hormone called aldosterone, I mentioned it's a mineral corticoid, that helps us hold on to minerals. So things like coffee and alcohol, they are also diuretics. But when we have chronic adrenal stress, we're going to be peeing out minerals. Sodium, chloride, potassium, magnesium. There's a lot of data showing that when you are stressed and you have high amounts of cortisol, you actually pee out potassium. That's actually in Guyton's physiology. So we know we can lose a lot of minerals. And guess what? Where minerals go, water goes. So minerals do help with blood pressure. Now, things like salt and adding in high quality salt, does that actually, would that cause high blood pressure? Typically not because your body has ways to modulate it. Unless you have some kind of a kidney disease, your body will be able to regulate that. But when you don't have enough minerals, that can be a big thing. And if you have adrenal dysfunction issues where your aldosterone and your mineral corticoids are low, it's very probable that you're peeing out a lot of your minerals. So what do we do? So number one is you have to do an inventory with your functional medicine doctor or yourself about where those stressors are coming from. So of course, we always look at food. We always look at blood sugar. We always look at, do we have a good anti-inflammatory, low toxin, nutrient dense kind of diet? You know, my kind of approach is kind of a paleo-ish template and we can dial in the macronutrients according to your needs. Do you have gut infections? Is there, un, is there unaddressed emotional stress? What are the underlying stressors under the hood? We want to make sure that those are fully being addressed. Uh, outside of that, we're going to work on supporting the adrenals. We're going to work on supporting the hormones, the cortisol hormones. If it's low, if it's high, we may want to work on bringing that down. We may add in extra minerals, extra sodium, extra chloride, extra potassium, extra magnesium. We may add in things to help support mineral corticoids. One of the best herbs that you can do to support mineral corticoids is licorice. Now, a lot of licorice that are out there, they're deglycerized. That's DGL. Now, that kind of licorice is not good for blood pressure uh, in enhancement because it's going to be more of a gut healing nutrient. And again, if you have high blood pressure, you want to stay away from a, a non-deglycerized licorice. But licorice can be very helpful. Um, there's other medicines out there that are like, um, it's like a, a, a similar brand to a Cortef, 
Okay, Cortaf's a cortisol. They have one, I think it's Florinef is the, how it's pronounced, Florinef. And that's a bioidentical type of aldosterone that can be used. I prefer to use the licorice though. That works very, very well. But you gotta get to the root cause. You gotta figure out, okay, where are my adrenal stressors? Uh, do I have gut issues? Are there unresolved emotional stressors? Do I have blood pressure, uh, blood sugar issues going up and down? Blood sugar issues eventually will create stress on the adrenals and eventually create blood pressure issues. So. First thing is hydration, adequate level of high quality filtered water, add extra minerals into it. You may wanna take a high quality mineral supplement on top of that. Work on blood sugar stability, healthy proteins and fats at each meal. Get your adrenals tested. I run what's called the Dutch test, which stands for dried urine for testing comprehensive hormones. And we'll look at all of the adrenal cortisol levels. We'll look at adrenal function. There really isn't a, a mainstream test out there for aldosterone. Typically, I just look at a lot of the symptoms of aldosterone deficiency, like the orthostatic hypotension test. There's one that you can do. It's called the Raglan's test, where they'll have you sit down, or they'll take your blood pressure standing up, and they'll have you bend over or sit down, and, and then they'll, have you, they'll kind of have you, have you change your body positions. And if you have more than a 10, draw, a 10 points, uh, 10 millimeters of mercury on a blood pressure cuff in systolic, the top number, that's a sign there's probably some type of adrenal issue. That's a pretty good marker. So blood pressure is a big one. That type of Raglan's test I just mentioned. Minerals, blood sugar stability, paleo template. Look at underlying stressors. And then from there, get your adrenals tested. We talked about the Dutch test. And then from there, we can kind of dial in and fine tune the different protocols that can be used based on your adrenal pattern. And again, just be careful. Licorice is a good herb, but if you have high cortisol, that would actually make your problem worse and actually increase your blood pressure. So be mindful of that. You really want to work with a practitioner if you have issues that are more chronic. And again, a lot of these issues are connected to POTS, right? What's POTS? Postural, orthostatic, tachycardia, I think, syndrome, right? Um, that's basically, they do the tilt table test, kind of similar things, right? Usually patients that have POTS, they have the blood pressure issues, right? They have the orthostatic hypotension. They have a lot of issues with minerals and they're very, very sensitive to blood sugar. They usually have to eat more frequently every two to three hours and some actually need a little bit of carbohydrate in, in the form of starch. So if you have POTS issues, and I look at like the low blood pressure and the orthostatic hypotension, that just means posturally induced, right? High, posturally induced low blood pressure. That's usually like a precursor to POTS. Now, you may never develop full-on POTS. That's kind of like the pathological version with the tilt table, right? But it tells you that you're moving in that direction and the adrenals have to be looked at. The diet has to be looked at. Blood sugar, nutrition, and I would say even the gut should be looked at too. So again, this is Dr. J. If you have low blood pressure, it's a sign there's other hormonal issues happening. And if you're female, I wouldn't be surprised if other female hormone issues like estrogen dominance and low progesterone and maybe aberrant cycle PMS or maybe even the start of perimenopause or menopausal symptoms may be coming your way. So you want to get ahead of this so you can fix it so it doesn't spiral off into other hormonal systems down the road. All right, guys, I'm available for consultation support. Click down link below if you want to reach out to me or my colleagues and also I'll open it up for questions for y'all. What's cooking? Let's see what is up. If you're dehydrated, does that mean um, your blood pressure? Well, if you're dehydrated, your blood pressure may be low. Now, it could also be high because you're stressed out, but typically it would drop because 70% of what's in your, in your blood is water, right? So we have to have good water to have adequate pressure. So good, clean water. I use high quality either my Topo Chico during the day, or I have a reverse osmosis filter with a secondary post-mineral filter, and I'll also pinch some minerals in there as well, some Redmond's Real Salt too. Okay, excellent. Um, what are good minerals that last longer in the body without easily being released? Well, I mean, your basic minerals are going to be like your sodium, your chloride, your potassium, your magnesium, right? Those are your big ones, maybe a little bit of calcium. Those are your basic minerals. A good Redmond's Real Salt will have about 70 of them. A good multi will have about those, you know, six to eight or so. So a good Redmond's Real Salt, a good mineral water, a Pellegrino or a Topo Chico is great, a Voss, a Fuji, an Evian is good. And then outside of that, you can always get a trace mineral supplement like Endure or 40,000 volts is also a, a very good one too. 
Uh, males, 40, previously tested, with pot, previously tested with parasitic mold issues, dialed in diet, but seems to have pot symptoms. Is there a good way to determine if it's pots or something else? I mean, if you have pot symptoms, that's enough for me. I mean, conventional medicine will do a tilt table test looking at blood pressure and stuff like that. But I mean, in the end, they're not going to do too much to fix that from a root cause perspective. So I would typically test their adrenals. I test most people's adrenals. Why? Because your adrenals are the they're the interplay between the sympathetic nervous system and the rest of the body. Because when you have a lot of sympathetic nervous system stress, you make a lot of cortisol and adrenaline, and you can see that in your adrenal function. So the more you're calling upon your adrenals, the more you're going to see dysfunctional adrenals on the testing. So it's good to look at that. I've elevated liver enzymes. I don't drink any alcohol whatsoever. Never have. Follow a paleo template and... And live a very healthy lifestyle. I have Hashimoto's. Could that cause the liver enzymes to be elevated? Uh, maybe. I mean, it just depends upon. I need to know more about the history, but liver enzymes can also be elevated if you work out before you go get your blood tested, right? Liver enzymes are part of a comprehensive metabolic profile, CMT. They run ALT, alanine transferase, aspartate transferase, and then uh, the GGT for the gallbladder. So it just depends on. Um, the history of that. How many times have you had it done? Uh, was there exercise or a lot of muscle, sore muscles before that? So you have to look at that. If your diet's pretty good, then you might have to look deeper underneath the hood regarding the gut. Okay, great. Uh, let me keep on rolling here. How does the adrenal weakness cause estrogen dominance in menstruating women? Well, when you have adrenal issues, right, typically you're going to be pulling from progesterone to make some of your adrenal hormones. So the more adrenally stressed you are, you're going to pull from progesterone to make more stress hormones to manage stress and inflammation. And when you pull from progesterone, that's going to skew the estrogen-progesterone ratio, putting you more into estrogen dominance. That's pretty common. Great question, though. Also, for a female, is it normal to feel heart palpitations after eating my fasting insulin 3.4? It depends. I mean, part of a food allergy response could be an increase in heart rate. So you want to make sure mineral is good and you want to make sure there's no food allergens. I heard a chiropractor say that our gut bacteria should be 85% good, 15% bad. Does the bad bacteria serve any purpose? I mean, usually there's always going to be some level of bad bacteria in the body, right? I mean, I think everything kind of has a role, right? To, to say nothing, say anything bad uh, should be abolished and we should be at zero bad bacteria. That's probably not how mother nature works. There's probably some role, just like we see lots of scavengers out there, like pests out in mother, you know, out in nature, like bugs and flies and all those things. Well, you know, they, they have an important role at feeding other types of animals that, that do other things that keep the environment in balance. So there's probably some role for them. I wouldn't say that, I wouldn't try to be, be God saying, oh, no, they're all bad. There's probably some synergism with the rest of the microbiome that they do serve. But we want to keep them in check, though. That's for sure. We definitely want to keep them at a lower level and keep a lot of the good stuff you know, more predominant. I think that's good. Any ideas for protein in the urine from kidneys? I mean, number one, confirm it. Confirm it if it's in the urine. Confirm if it's actual protein in the urine. Get a urinalysis. See if protein's high. Uh, look at the other protein markers. See if there's any bacteria or any inflammation up there. See if glomular filtration or your filtration rate is down. If that is the case, then you want to look deeper at why the kidneys could be stressed. Most of the time, it's going to be um, high levels of carbohydrate. 80% of all kidney transplants happen with diabetics. That tells you something, right? People don't want to talk about it, but blood sugar is very damaging on the kidneys. Protein's only a problem on the kidneys when the kidneys are already damaged. So if that's the case, you would just kind of do a moderate to lower protein ketogenic template because fats are pretty neutral on the kidneys. Okay, great question so far. Excellent, y'all. So in general, low blood pressure, dizziness, orthostatic symptoms are common, especially in women. They're very common in women. Uh, certain times throughout the cycle, you see it more. Get to the root cause. Look at blood sugar stability. Look at your diet. Get your adrenals tested. And then make sure you're adding some minerals back in as well. That's going to be really helpful and will start supporting your body's ability to heal. Can gluten sensitivity issues drive adrenal issues or is, it, or is it the other way around? Is there a connection? What's the mechanism? Well, yeah, gluten sensitivity is going to just create stress. It's going to create inflammation. Part of that inflammatory response will be to call upon your adrenals to deal with the inflammation. And then there's a separate inflammation from gluten that is gut permeability. Gut permeability is going to increase 
right? Because you're going to have an increase in zonulin with gluten. That's going to make your gut more permeable. A more permeable gut's going to increase gluten proteins floating around in the bloodstream, which is going to increase your chance of autoimmunity and attack on other tissues like the thyroid. So you really want to be on top of that. All right, y'all. Hope you enjoyed this. Click down below to reach out more. Thumbs up, subscribe, hit the bell for more notifications. You guys have a phenomenal day. Take care, y'all. Bye.